Hello and thanks for joining us for our mid-morning edition of Adidang News. I'm Mark Broom. Let's kick things off with a look at the day's headlines. Prosecutors request 30 years behind bars for disgraced ex-president Park Geun-hye, who was impeached last year in a corruption scandal. If the court agrees, it means she'll likely live out the rest of her life in prison. Caught on tape, Japan's horrific wartime atrocities on Korean women. Actual video footage has been released showing Korean women killed by Japanese troops during World War II. Decades later, still no sincere apology from Tokyo. Plus, North Korea is sending athletes to next month's Pyeongchang Paralympics in South Korea following its high-profile participation in the Winter Olympics. Our top story this morning, South Korean prosecutors have demanded ousted former President Park Geun-hye serve 30 years in jail for her role in a massive corruption scandal that marked a stunning fall from grace for the country's first ever female leader. Faced with 18 charges, including bribery, abuse of power and leaking state secrets, three decades in prison uh, mean a life sentence for Park, who is 66 years old. Uh, Lee jung Yun starts us off. If the prosecution gets its way, former President Park geun could be spending the rest of her life behind bars. Tuesday saw a long-awaited hearing at the Seoul Central District Court in which they presented their sentencing demands for South Korea's former conservative leader. The prosecutors have demanded 30 years, which is five more than what had been demanded for her close confidant, Choi sun -shil. They reasoned that given the gravity of the case and that Park was the country's leader, a heavier sentencing was necessary. At the hearing, the prosecutor said Park tarnished South Korea's constitutional history and that she harmed constitutional values by privatizing power entrusted to her by the people. On top of jail time, they also sought a fine of 118.5 billion won, or 109 million U.S. dollars. Last year, Park became the first South Korean president to be impeached and removed from office. She was indicted last April on 18 charges, including bribery and abuse of power, 15 of which she was found guilty. She was found to have accepted bribes in exchange for political favors for a number of the country's biggest conglomerates, such as SK, Samsung and Lotte. Park is also accused of letting her longtime confidant Choi sun -shil meddle in state affairs, even though Choi held no official post. And they are both accused of coercing businesses into paying some 73 million U.S. dollars to two non-profit organizations Choi controlled. Legal experts had expected a heavy sentence for Park after Choi was sentenced earlier this month to 20 years for 13 overlapping charges. That was the heaviest sentence so far among those involved in the corruption scandal. At Tuesday's hearing, which started at 10 a.m. and wrapped up less than five hours later, prosecutors delivered their remarks on Park's sentencing and her lawyers delivered their final defense. Lee jong -yun, Arirang News. Now, a horrifying video was made public for the first time on Tuesday. It shows the scene of a 1944 massacre of Korean women by Japanese troops this, of course, during World War II. Just a warning that um, you may well find the following uh, images and video in this report distressing. Our Lee Sung Jae with the details. The team of South Korean scholars and researchers that discovered the video in the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration made it public on Tuesday at an international conference in Seoul on wartime sexual slavery. The 19-second black-and-white clip filmed by Allied forces of the United States and China adds to existing documentary evidence that the Japanese military shot and killed 30 Korean women in the western Chinese city of Tengchung on September 13, 1944. The video shows a group of bodies abandoned together and a Chinese soldier who is believed to have been at the scene to bury the bodies, taking a sock off of one of the victims. This is the first known video evidence of the act since the same research team disclosed the Allied Forces Operation Diary in 2016, which revealed terms used throughout the record, indicating the 30 Korean women were sex slaves for the Japanese. With the video, experts believe there is now overwhelming evidence to prove without question the level of Japan's wartime atrocities against the forced sex slaves. 
Confessions, documents, photos, videos. What more do you need? Our job is to further piece together evidence of a time in history that's being left behind. Despite the mounting evidence, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe continues to demand that South Korea move on. He told President Moon Jae-in earlier this month that in democracy, leaders must make decisions while resigning themselves to reproach, adding that otherwise, countries cannot establish future-oriented relationships. Still seeking a proper apology from the Japanese government, the issue is increasingly urgent for Korea, as another former victim died earlier this month, leaving the number of registered Korean survivors at 30. Lee seung Arirang News. Now, North Korea will send its athletes to South Korea's Pyeongchang Paralympic Games. Seoul's Unification Ministry made the announcement on Tuesday following inter-Korean talks on the matter. However, there will be no repeat visit by the North Art Troop or cheering squad who added that extra touch of glamour to the recently completed Winter Olympics. Gwon Jang-ho with the details. Another round of inter-Korean talks took place at the border village of Panmunjom on Tuesday, this time to discuss North Korea's participation at the Paralympics, which open on March 9th. The chief representatives from the two sides began the meeting by expressing their mutual satisfaction with the Winter Olympics that had just concluded. The Olympics was much richer with the North Korean delegation coming, and I believe it contributed greatly to delivering a message of peace and cooperation to the world. I believe this 23rd Winter Olympics became an opportunity that raised the stature of the Korean people. Then they sat down to hash out the arrangements for the Paralympics. The South's Unification Ministry revealed that the two sides agreed for the North Korean delegation to arrive on March 7, two days before the opening ceremony. They will cross the land border via the Gyeonggi Line in Paju, north of Seoul. The delegation will consist of four North Korean Paralympic Committee members, along with 20 athletes and guardians, 12 more than has been approved by the International Paralympic Committee so far. A final approval from the IPC is expected to be made in the coming days. But unexpectedly, Pyongyang have decided not to send the arts troupe and cheering squad that Seoul had initially agreed to in talks last month. The ministry said that the North Koreans cited some internal reasons and that they felt that the arts troupe and cheering squad that had come for the Olympics had done enough to raise spirits and improve relations. Although Seoul says the talks were successful and that the North's participation in the Paralympics will further make it a celebration for peace and cooperation, the North's sudden change of heart to bring a small delegation raises questions about their commitment to the cause. Kwon Jao, Arirang News. The United States says it will continue its diplomatic efforts to denuclearize North Korea despite news that its point man on the regime is retiring. This comes amid heightened hopes for US-North Korea talks following South Korea's successful hosting of the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. Park so Yeon reports. The announcement came just as signs were emerging that Pyongyang may be willing to talk to Washington. The U.S. Special Representative for North Korea Policy Joseph Yoon says he will step down from his post at the end of this week. He said the decision was entirely his own, but the timing comes at a surprising juncture, as South Korea recently relayed that North Korea is open to direct discussions with the United States. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson sought to dissuade him, but reluctantly accepted Yoon's resignation with regret. Yoon, like Tillerson, is an advocate of engaging in dialogue with Pyongyang, a tricky position to take amid the Trump administration's policy of applying maximum pressure over engagement. Joseph Yoon's diplomatic career spans more than three decades, serving as ambassador to Malaysia from 2013 to 2016 under then-President Barack Obama. Yoon played a key role in tackling North Korea's nuclear issues as a U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, appointed by the Obama administration in October 2016. He also played an instrumental role in releasing Otto Warmbier, an American student detained in North Korea for more than a year. Yoon's authority to negotiate with North Korea appeared to be undermined by a tug of war between the White House and the State Department over the direction of North Korea policy under the Trump administration. However, Yoon told The Washington Post that his retirement was not a decision based on policy differences with President Trump or his inner circle. 
He added that he's very hopeful about the prospect of talks resolving the standoff over North Korea's nuclear program. Nevertheless, his departure will leave the Trump administration without an envoy for engaging North Korea or an ambassador in Seoul, a spot that has been vacant for a year. Park so Arirang News. South Korean military authorities have summoned Chinese military officials in protest against the recent entrance of a Chinese warplane into South Korea's air defense identification zone. Seoul stressed that such acts raise unnecessary tension in the region. Oh Jung Yee reports from Seoul's defense ministry. South Korea has lodged a strong complaint with China after one of its warplanes entered South Korea's air defense identification zone. On Tuesday, a Chinese reconnaissance plane flew in South Korea's air defense ID zone for over four hours, even flying close to South Korea's territorial waters. Later in the day, South Korea's defense ministry summoned three Chinese military officials in Seoul to protest the act and stressed that unannounced entrances can raise unnecessary tension in the region. The foreign ministry called in the Chinese ambassador to South Korea and expressed its regret. This marks the second time this year that a Chinese warplane has flown into South Korea's air defense zone, the first happening in late January. On Tuesday, according to Seoul's Joint Chiefs of Staff, the plane entered the zone at 9.34 a.m. and later came within 56 kilometers of Ulleungdo Island in the East Sea before flying out of the zone at 2.01 p.m. This prompted South Korea to dispatch fighter jets, including F-15Ks and KF-16s, to monitor the plane's activity. Seoul also sent a direct warning to the pilot and called on China via the two countries' hotline to stop acts that could trigger accidental conflicts. Beijing claimed it was part of a routine exercise, but Seoul's military authority said Tuesday's flight was unusual and that it could affect South Korean military activities as they were likely sent to collect data. Chinese military planes have entered South Korea's air defense zone multiple times since China unilaterally declared its own such zone in 2013, with some parts overlapping with that of Korea's and Japan's. But their flights had remained south of the peninsula until now, which is why Seoul's military authorities saw Tuesday's flight as threatening. Oh jung Arirang News. Now, for a look at the stories making headlines around the world, and we're going to catch up on the latest in Syria. Airstrikes by pro-government forces are reportedly continuing, despite Russian President Vladimir Putin's call for a so-called humanitarian pause. For more on this and other international stories, let's turn to our Noah Adam. So, Adam, Putin uh, had called for a five-hour pause to shelling every day, but it seems this bombardment continues. That's right, Mark. The humanitarian pause, as Putin put it, was meant to allow for civilians to evacuate the rebel-held area of eastern Gutar. It was meant to start Tuesday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. local time, but activists on the ground reported airstrikes and artillery fire from pro-regime positions within minutes of when the pause was meant to start. Russia and its ally Syria, however, blamed the rebels for the collapse of the truce. They accused rebels of shelling what Moscow has described as humanitarian corridors meant to give civilians safe passage out of the enclave. The insurgents, however, denied such shelling, and UN Security Council members, including the US, have been demanding Moscow implement a 30-day ceasefire resolution, which was adopted on Saturday. Meanwhile, Russia's proposed pause in hostilities is also meant to allow humanitarian aid to come in to the area, but the International Committee of the Red Cross says the five-hour pause is too short for delivery of vast amounts of life-saving aid. Hundreds of people have now died during the bombardment, which intensified about a week and a half ago, marking one of the deadliest in the Syrian civil war, now entering its eighth year. Without a clear indication as to whether or not the UN ceasefire will be enforced, eastern Ghouta could face a similar fate to other parts of Syria, which have been crushed by the government to win back territory. The latest fall to Syria's military was eastern Aleppo in 2016. 
In a rare public speech, U.S. First Lady Melania Trump has expressed her support to student activists campaigning against gun violence following the recent high school shooting in Florida. Tuesday's encouraging remarks came at a White House luncheon she hosted for the spouses of the nation's governors. I have been heartened to see children across this country using their voices to speak out and try to create change. They're our future, and they deserve a voice. Her husband, meanwhile, has long resisted calls for stricter gun control, but has shown some leeway after meeting survivors of the Florida shooting. However, right-wing critics and the National Rifle Association continue to take jabs at the activists, and some, and some have even accused the FBI of staging attacks to spur anti-gun sentiment. Germany's main administrative court has ruled that cities in the country can ban some diesel cars in an effort to protect citizens from harmful emissions. The Federal Administrative Court in Leipzig said Tuesday that the heavily polluted cities of Stuttgart and Dusseldorf can gradually implement the ban on older diesel vehicles. The move may trigger other cities and even some countries across Europe to take similar action as they struggle to meet EU air quality standards. However, it's bitter news for German car giants Daimler, BMW and especially Volkswagen, which has already seen a drop in their diesel vehicle sales amid the firm's emissions cheating scandal. The new chairman of the Federal Reserve has vowed to prevent the U.S. economy from overheating while sticking with a plan to gradually raise interest rates. In his first public appearance as the head of the Fed, Jerome Powell testified before the U.S. House of Representatives Financial Services Committee on Tuesday that the Fed would balance the need to guard against excessive Inflation with the benefit of allowing the economy to enjoy the tailwinds of tax cuts and strong global growth. While the Fed has forecast three rate increases in 2018, some believe it could lift its rate four times this year if the Trump administration's tax cuts provide a larger than expected boost to the economy and inflation. Business sentiment among Korean firms has worsened, mainly due to fewer working days in February as it overlapped with the Lunar New Year holiday. The Bank of Korea says its business sentiment index, or BSI, among overall industries edged down one point from the previous month to 77. It also cited a steep decline among manufacturers, particularly in the shipbuilding and automobile sectors, that dropped two points from the previous month to 75, and that's the lowest level since January of last year. A reading below 100 means there are more pessimists than optimists about the economy. Efforts are continuing to normalise operations at General Motors Korea. GM Korea and its local labour union are holding a third round of talks today as the company tries to slash costs in a bid to keep its South Korea-based factories open. Wage negotiations were halted early this month after GM said it would shut one of its four factories in Korea and decide the fate of the other three in the coming weeks. What happens next is largely expected to depend on concessions made by the union and the level of support GM can secure from the South Korean government. GM has proposed a $2.2 billion debt-to-equity swap for GM Korea in exchange for government support worth up to $1 billion. Now, in a move that could help Korea to share the stigma of having some of the longest working hours in the OECD, the National Assembly has voted to reduce maximum working hours from 68 to 52 hours a week. It's hoped the new regulations will improve labour productivity, uh, but also the overall quality of life. Kim Mogyun reports. South Korea has some of the longest working hours in the world. According to OECD data, laborers in Korea worked 2,069 hours on average in 2016, way above the OECD average of 1,763 hours. To tackle this problem, there has been heated debate over the past five years on revising the bill on working hours. And finally, the National Assembly has made a big step forward. A parliament committee on Tuesday passed a bill to shorten working hours in South Korea. 
The National Assembly's Environment and Labor Committee endorsed the bill, which calls for reducing the country's maximum statutory working hours to 52 hours a week from the current 68. Under the current law, the maximum working hours in Korea were 68 hours per week, as the law excluded Saturdays and Sundays as part of the 40-hour working days, making it possible to work an additional 16 hours during the weekend on top of any extended working hours. The revised working hours will now include the weekends in the weekly 40-hour working day period, reducing the maximum hours to 52. The bill will also shorten the working hours for under-18s from 40 hours a week to 35 hours and cut the number of business types exempt from working hour limits from the current 26 to 5. The bill will now be passed to the Judiciary Committee for deliberation and, if passed, will be put for a vote at the National Assembly's plenary session, possibly as early as Wednesday. However, a labor law expert says there have been continued objections from many industries amid worries that the revision could harm productivity. The problem is that workers are worrying that the new bill could lower their salary due to reduced working hours, while business owners are worrying that they might have to pay additional personal expenses for extra hours outside of the bill's 40 working hour limit. The expert said that it's important to keep in mind the purpose of this bill, which is to protect the health and the quality of life of laborers. He added that both sides should be able to comply with the changes by bearing in mind the original motive. To minimize the impact of the possible changes, the committee says the new law will be enforced gradually over the next three years. It will be applied to firms with 300 workers or more from this July, while firms with 50 to 299 workers will adapt the system in 2020, and those with 5 to 49 workers will follow it from 2021. Kim mo Arirang News. Good morning. Some highly anticipated rainfall is on the way for the entire nation. Rain will start to drop showers from southern provinces before spreading to the rest of the country. Seoul will receive showers from around lunchtime. But despite the rain, we'll see readings similar to what just had lower than yesterday. And Seoul and Daejeon will get up to 8 degrees Celsius this afternoon. But rain will pour down in Busan this afternoon, while Daejeon will be mild at 19 degrees along with a good amount of rainfall. Now, Seoul could see a mix of rain and snow tomorrow morning, which is a national holiday here in Korea. Then readings will jump back up to mild side again this weekend. With that, let's take a look at the international weather for beers around the world. Well, many regions in South Korea will receive welcome rain on this last day of February. Most parts in North Korea will also see either rain or snow under cloudy skies. And as for the rest of Asia, Tokyo will notice big gaps in temperatures between lows and highs, so dress accordingly. Meanwhile, Melbourne enjoyed some late summer sun yesterday, but that's about to change with strong winds in the forecast. And heading to North America, rain will continue and expect clouds to cap off the day in Vancouver. And Montreal will also have a rainy Wednesday. And taking you to South America, nothing seems to be out of the ordinary in terms of weather conditions. And weather, or rain that is, returns in Bogota. And taking you to Europe, sweeping in from Siberia, a monster winter storm has brought rare snow to Rome and bitter winds to Britain. The most severe cold is forecast to hit Eastern Europe over the next five days. And lastly, to Africa, Addis Ababa will have another day with unstable weather conditions. And that's all the weather update for now. Well, that's uh, all the news we have for now on this Wednesday morning here in Seoul. Just to let you know that tomorrow is Independence Movement Day here in Korea, so we will not be having our uh, 10 a.m. newscast as usual, but we will be here at noon and 6 p.m. on that day. Our next scheduled newscast today, though, that's coming up at noon Korea time. So until then, goodbye.